Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to spend uh, with us uh, this morning on this beautiful fall morning, at least here in, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And welcome to Shaking Up Small Cities, our conversations on repurposing, remodeling, and repositioning Pennsylvania's communities. Uh, a few housekeeping items uh, as we get started before I turn it over to our, to our panel. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. The recording will be shared via email one hour after the session ends. A post-webinar survey will be shared at the end. So please let us know how you enjoyed this session, uh, any ideas for future sessions, and, and anything we could improve on. We always love, love to hear those tips. Um, this course has been approved for one and a half AIA learning units. And please make sure to drop your questions in the chat. I'll be reviewing them uh, with, with some help from others, and we will try to get to as many questions as you can to keep this conversation going as possible. So please make sure you do that uh, during the course of the webinar and, and, and toward the end where we can get to some of those questions. So once again, welcome to Shaking Up Small Cities. Uh, this is a platform for initiatives and conversations around how architects have contributed to the repurposing, remodeling, and repositioning of communities all across Pennsylvania. Today's session will feature the borough of Etna, the world's first certified echo district, and one of three Pittsburgh river towns that make up the tri-borough echo district. The session will also highlight Philadelphia's rebuild program, funding investment in parks, recreation centers, and libraries and neighborhoods throughout the cities. And I am, and I should have said this a little earlier, but uh, to introduce myself in case you don't know me, I'm Steve Swarney, I'm the executive director of AIA Pennsylvania. And I am your uh, kind of host today before I turn it over to everybody that you're, you're here to hear from. Um, I would like to briefly introduce our panel. So I'd like you to meet our panelists for today. Uh, first, we have Amanda Colon Smith, the Director of Community Engagement for Rebuild Philadelphia. And you will see Amanda's face on the next slide and you can probably see her on the camera. Uh, we also have Kira Strong, Executive Director of Rebuild Philadelphia. And Megan Tunyon, I'm sorry, you know, I had that. I just had a 10 second, <laughs> I apologize. Megan Tunyon, uh, who is the Executive Director of Aetna Community Organization and the Vice President of Aetna uh, Bureau and a Council Member. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge, and I, and I probably jumped a little bit out of slides uh, before I introduce Robert, um, I, I, I want to acknowledge uh, two of AIA Pennsylvania's uh, past presidents, uh, Jeff Pasfa, our 2021 AIA president, and Adam Trott, our 2022 AIA president. And really all the credit for, for this fantastic program goes to Jeff and then carrying on uh, by Adam. Uh, we, we started off with a couple sessions that were very successful and highlighting some other communities in Pennsylvania and got a lot of good ideas, a lot of legislators on board, uh, not only um, uh, highlighting what they're doing, the fantastic things that they're doing in their communities, but also giving ideas to other communities. So uh, a big shout out to Jeff and, and to Adam for carrying on the tradition and which brings us to another fantastic program today. And finally, I want to introduce our moderator for today, Robert Tunyon, AIA, uh, an associate at Rothschild's Doino Collaborative, a board member and also a board member of Aetna Community Organization. So thank you, Robert. And, and I think you're really in for a fantastic program today. Uh, Robert, uh, you are, and, and I don't want to embarrass you, but you are probably the most organized and well-prepared moderator we've had on any of those, and we've had some good ones, but uh, we actually had to uh, uh, pare down some of the questions, uh, <laughs> but uh, very well-prepared, and I think you're in for a very, very good session today, so thank you for agreeing to do that. Thank you again to our panelists, and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kira Strong from Rebuild Philadelphia. Thanks so much, Steve, uh, and thank you, Adam. Uh, and Jeff for organizing us, uh, bringing us here today, uh, and also fellow um, panelists. This is really excited. We're excited to be here, um, have this conversation, uh, and happy to share a little bit about the rebuild initiative of the city of Philadelphia. Um, we are working on parks, rec centers, and libraries across the city of Philadelphia. Um, existing uh, structures, existing facilities, really focused on uh, addressing decades of, uh, unfortunately, of disinvestment. Um, and as we all know, I think across 
um, some of our urban and, and rural areas, um, the challenge of keeping our facilities as pristine and lovely as, as we might like. Um, so our current mayor uh, had a really great idea uh, to think about how to do um, an across the city initiative to really address this issue. So uh, Philadelphia, um, some might be familiar, issued a um, or mandated a sweetened beverage tax, which is a primary um, part of our funding to make uh, this program happen uh, back in 2017. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, um, but that was the impetus to get this started. Um, and we really, the mayor and others had a vision at the very beginning that instead of just a capital uh, improvement program, that this program was going to have a couple other facets um, that we think make it really unique. And those are a really strong focus on community engagement, ensuring that residents have the um, ability and the space um, and are encouraged to help inform what happens at their neighborhood sites. Uh, and also that the work um, that would uh, come about because of this initiative would look like um, the vendors, whether it's on the professional services uh, side or the construction side, would be reflective of uh, and look like the city of Philadelphia. So a very strong focus um, on diversity and inclusion in the work we're doing. Okay, next slide, thank you. So when we started, um, one of our big challenges is, um, was that though we are really fortunate to have a budget of about, uh, at this point, it's a little over um, $500 uh, million, we knew that for the size of Philadelphia's capital infrastructure, that that would be nowhere near enough to address the need. So uh, we have 406 facilities, as you can see here on the screen, um, and realized through an assessment done um, at the beginning of the initiative that only about 10% of them were con considered to be in good condition. So a big challenge for us. So not that we expect you to read this slide, um, but happy to share this afterwards, of course. Um, but we, again, um, knew that equity um, would really be a big piece of how we chose these sites. So we looked at data indicators, um, including uh, crime indicators, uh, poverty, um, health risks, and we also looked at some certain uh, market uh, indicators. So where could an investment like what we're doing with Rebuild maybe help uh, stabilize a neighborhood, for example, that might be trending um, downward? Could this type of capital investment really make a difference to help stabilize. Um, this started, of course, it's a citywide program. We have 10 council districts uh, in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, they certainly have um, you know, knowledge of expertise in their district uh, and needed to be, of course, a part of the um, process and the enabling legislation to be able to lift this, this program up um, to move. So we worked with them really closely um, back in 2016 and 17 to determine which sites we would work on. Uh, we landed on 72 different sites all across the city of Philadelphia. All the sites, as you could gather, are high need sites. And the majority of the neighborhoods um, in which they are located are also really high need neighborhoods with a couple of those um, like I mentioned, where they might be um, working class or maybe lower middle class neighborhoods, but where this kind of investment uh, we really felt would be would be helpful. So in the very beginning, um, we conceptualized that our budgets would be in the very, very beginning, maybe between $500,000 up to maybe 10 million at the max. And over the years, as I'm sure folks um, attending are aware, we've seen construction price increases, uh, we also certainly saw as the years went on that the needs at our sites were even greater than were um, initially thought to be. So our budgets now, as you can see, range from $1 million at a site. Um, there are very few of those, um, unfortunately, all the way up to $20 million. And it's really the budget and the scope work is based on what that site needs. So here's for those that, that like this stuff. Um, a breakdown to give you just a sense of how um, our you know, capital stack, so to speak, came together um, and how we thought about 
this, um, you know, how it would be funded. So I mentioned the sweet and beverage tax. Uh, we issued um, a bond and anticipate issuing at least two more um, in the future, but we issued an initial bond for about $86 million and the debt service of that is paid by the proceeds of the sweetened beverage tax. So that really is the bulk of the funding for rebuild at about $300 million. City um, also chipped in some capital funds through the annual budget process. And we were very, very fortunate to have um, a historic uh, contribution by the William Penn Foundation, which in Philadelphia is really our largest philanthropic um, partner and uh, entity in the city. And they contributed $100 million, which I think um, we should do, probably do some double checking to verify this, but is probably the largest, if not one of the largest uh, contributions of this kind in our country to public space. So really, um, I think quite a, quite a statement and quite a lean in on, on understanding. And again, even pre-pandemic, I think we all came to value and love our public spaces even more um, through the pandemic. Uh, but I would say they were certainly ahead of the game there. Um, and their hope and what is, I think, slightly interesting as well, is that you see there we have it called a match. So they wanted to make sure that they were positioning that contribution as a way to incentivize and encourage others to um, donate to rebuild into this initiative. So when we receive other dollars, whether <clears throat> it's our bond dollars, it's the capital fund from the city or other um, state, federal or philanthropy, that that is actually what helps release that $100 million. So it is predicated on a match system, um, which has been really great. And we've had donors certainly happy to hear that if they give um, you know, $100, another $100 from William Penn is, is unlocked. So that's a pretty interesting structure and has worked really well for us. Um, and the last thing I'll mention on this slide is we are at a point in the program we have committed and spent um, a total of about $350 million so far. So we are we are in it, <laughs> it's moving. Um, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that as well. Next slide, thank you. So we, um, as I mentioned at the outset, um, one of the hopes of this being a little bit like we, we kind of joke sometimes that we're almost like a, a startup in the middle of city government. Uh, we're part of the managing director's office of the city of Philadelphia. We work incredibly closely with our partners at the Free Library of Philadelphia and the Parks and Rec Department, uh, but we sit separately and we sit within the organizing entity of the city. And the thought was that we would have a little bit more flexibility and a little bit more of a runway to prioritize, like I mentioned, engagement, which Amanda's going to talk about um, shortly. Uh, and also diversity inclusion in those that we hire. So to this point, we knew that, at least in Philadelphia, um, you know, we have a number of diverse businesses and individuals um, that have interest in working in the trades or the professional services, but the on-ramps are not always there. So before we even started work on Rebuild, we um, started two different programs one geared towards individuals who have an interest in joining the union trades and then the other one around businesses who are interested in working on city work and building capacity so this slide here talks a little bit about our workforce development training program so we have um, this is we've been very nimble in this program we've worked with a number of different union trades and carpentry, masonry, roofers, um, finishing trades, and kind of um, calibrated our cohorts depending on the need of the moment and really working with those individual trades on where opportunities are for diverse individuals uh, and women. So, so far we have 76% of our program graduates that are accepted into apprenticeships or full-time construction related or design related work. So we're very pleased with that. Um, we have 94 that have graduated um, and we are continuing to, we just started a brand new cohort um, this month uh, of individuals interested in the trades. Next slide, thank you. So on the business side of that, 
we started a program um, called Rebuild Ready, and I'll talk about the emerging vendors there in just a moment. Um, Rebuild Ready Small Business Program is really geared at how do we ensure that there's a very high touch technical assistance capacity building program that could help businesses interested in work on rebuild or other work within the city of Philadelphia. So anything from helping with um, creating a qualification statement, uh, attending pre-bid meetings, working on estimating jobs and bidding on jobs so that you're bidding um, as accurately as possible so that you're not also, for example, inadvertently um, bidding something too low, getting the job and then finding out you're not gonna make any money on it. Um, getting bonding uh, also can be a challenge. Um, and actually through this program, we also started working on a, a very affordable line of credit program to ensure that you know cash flow, of course, is always um, a concern and issue for some of our smaller vendors. Uh, so that's also been a key piece of that program. And another piece to, at least uh, in Philadelphia, is when we count diversity um, and participation on our contracts, you have to be not only um, certified as a diverse or woman-owned business, but also um, registered within the City of Philadelphia Registry. So we started a program called the Emerging Vendors Program, where you would have one-on-one -on -one help to help you actually get certified and go through the rigmarole that that, I think we know, um, takes, um, and that you have to really lean into and be willing to spend the time to do, and then to get actually on the City of Philadelphia Registry. So we have uh, 65 businesses who have signed up for that support. And I think right now we have, it's about 40 who have actually gotten through the program and are both uh, certified um, and registered, which is terrific. And we give folks, um, those businesses, about a year and a half to go through that process um, in which they can um, have assistance from our program. And during that time, if they have work on a rebuild job site, we actually count that work as either a minority owned business or a woman owned business during the time they're getting um, certified. So that has been, I think, a big incentive for some of the businesses that we are, we are working with. Next slide. So we are really proud at this point that across the work that we're doing and the number of sites that we have active, um, that 56% um, of our contracts that are, and these represent either um, signed contracts, active contracts, not um, you know real real contracts with signatures to move forward. Um, that 56% of those are going to either women-owned businesses or um, diverse-owned businesses, and you can see the breakdown there. Um, we were for many many months at about hovering at about 63 or 64% participation was really terrific and we are finding obviously um, and we're going to continue to contend with this for sure that as our work volume increases um, those numbers are going to be harder to maintain so that's something we're certainly looking into and leaning into but really really proud of how well we've done there and then just to give a um, quick overview before I hand it over to Amanda to talk a little bit about our, about our engagement um, this is, I'll just point out, the photo behind these uh, stats is a pool we completed uh, last summer in the Fishtown neighborhood of Philadelphia um, on a tiny, tiny lot in a pretty dense row home neighborhood um, right next to a rec center, a library, um, and a police station. So you have this kind of grouping all together. It's a pretty unique um, site and a very small parcel, but heavily loved and heavily used. Um, and that was really a great, great project um, for a long time. It was the only pool in the city that was completely shut down for many, many years. So it was great to bring that back online. Um, and where we are now, so 17 projects in construction, 17 completed, 19 moving in design and, and engagement. Um, and then we have realized as we started in, you know, 2017, 18, our first bond was issued in 2018, um, and then throw a pandemic in there and getting these really big projects up off the ground um, that many had um, issues or concerns like roof leakages, boilers that had broken, et cetera, that were going to force a closure at a site before we could get there to do the full overhaul. So we've leaned in across 39 different sites to ensure that we are doing those quick fixes to make sure that sites can stay open um, for the families and, and children that use them. So 
um, busy for sure, but off we go. And I'd like to introduce Amanda Colon smith uh, our Director of Community Engagement, really making the magic happen so that these sites can move forward with the designs that they need. So, Amanda. All right, thank you so much, Kira. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to share um, with you guys about how we walk with community through each stage, each step of these um, really big, for, for a neighborhood that maybe hasn't seen investment in decades, this is their big project. Um, I would say, you know, these are not the downtown destination, but these are neighborhood level. And so I think in terms of just making sure, you know, this connects back with smaller cities that, each neighborhood of Philadelphia really is like its own community that you really have to get to know who are the partners, um, you know, what are the voices and the stories um, that are going to inform, um, you know, what will be generational projects that the next generation of kids and families will grow up in. And so each rebuild site really is, we kind of joke that it's a boutique process, <laughs> that each site is different. We partner with unique um, and I think every every site has a different, uh, you know, prime architect, landscape engineering firms, community engagement partner. About half of the projects are done with a nonprofit uh, project user who would, you know, these are long-standing CDCs or other community-based organizations that you know have been doing other um, investments in their communities from affordable housing and other um, public projects. And so um, we really try to make sure that each one feels like it's being done with folks who are careful and intentional to that specific site. This is not a copy and paste. You get the same playground at every site. There, no, no two are alike. So that um, does involve us going out regularly to meet with community from the large public meetings down to the stakeholder interviews and focus group approach, um, really creating interactive workshops and experiences this fiscal year, we're already at over 103. Um, you know, it, it's really about getting in the ground with community while, you know, capital projects are a long timeline, usually two to three years. And so making sure that they understand that it's worth the wait and we're, you know, connecting with you at each stage of those design milestones. Um, we really follow along with our design and construction team um, through, you know, concept, schematic, design development, bid docs, at each stage we're going out for public meetings. Um, and so I'll, I'll share a little bit about a, a few projects to kind of give you a, a case study uh, onto how um, those developed. Um, so Federal Square is one of my favorites. This is a project that was more, more so led directly through the rebuild office. Um, for engagement, we have um, smaller, um, firms that specialize in community engagement to help with the outreach, um, but also working very dynamically with our architects, our landscape teams to create interactive boards, those focus groups, those conversation design questions to really gather the ideas, the needs and the vision from community. Federal Squares um, in the Fairhill neighborhood in North Philadelphia, very um, disinvested community. And so the skepticism, you know, that comes of, is this really for us? What's changing in this community? Those kinds of questions come up and being able to have a holistic understanding for why community may question what's coming. Um, and to also take, take a step back and, and make sure there's alignment with what really is the vision. This project had um, early roots even before rebuild around re-envisioning um, the needs for this park and a variety of different community stakeholder group from a, a volunteer friends who have been small but mighty doing cleanups and taking care of the park, but also having an older um, membership who were trying to pass the torch, right? Trying to make sure that they could, you know, take their time as seniors to take their step back and pass it to the next generation. Um, we had, um, as you can see um, in the images, um, the center bottom images of a new soccer mini pitch, uh, a really uh, dynamic soccer club um, that was working with youth in the community, has been looking for a home for many years. And you know, while we're trying to look at a smaller footprint of a neighborhood uh, kind of passive park, seeing that we couldn't fit an entire new, you know, large size field, but what could we do that does create that spark of a new sport that wanted to be introduced with dedicated program partners. So being able to 
um, use a, a, a newer model of mini pitches uh, in partnership with the Philadelphia Union um, to introduce that was our second mini pitch that um, we had um, been able to do in the city it was really um, a wonderful um, opportunity to bring that um, into the neighborhood. We also just above that image is of the Portland Loo. Uh, it's in, we're calling ourselves the Philly Flush is our uh, moniker uh, for this um, new public restroom. This is also part of a citywide pilot. It was another great opportunity to take the feedback that we heard from folks about needing, you know, public restroom access, and um, partnering with the health department uh, for and Parks and Rec for the long-term operating. So rebuilds covering the capital costs, but for these other city departments to continue forward to provide this amenity. Um, so overall, this was a $3.9 million project. Um, definitely saw the uh, the bite of inflation, you know, caught us a little bit towards the tail end on bidding for this one. Um, but overall, was a, a you know a wonderful um, first phase. Phase two, we are coming back for more soccer and baseball, <laughs> but we were able to really find um, compromise with community to provide the basketball, updated uh, playgrounds for both two to five and five to twelve year olds, um, the mini pitch and the um, uh, restroom. We can go on to the next project. Heitzman, okay, so Heitzman Rec, uh, this one was done in partnership with one of our nonprofit project users, Impact Community Services, who has been serving in the Harrogate, Kensington, sort of north, on the way to Northeast uh, of Philadelphia. Um, and so this uh, site covers both a rec center building, um, fields were not a part of our project, but they're adjacent, you can kind of see the field lights um, in the background there as well as um, the playground and that covered two to five, five to 12 year olds and uh, some new adult fitness. This was a $4.3 million project that um, was really just, again, another opportunity to leverage so many different, um, so many different uh, components from indoor multi-purpose space, um, indoor basketball, um, an after aftercare room, new bathrooms, um, and, and a partnership with Mural Arts um, to also, um, we don't have the photos on here, but if you check out our uh, Rebuild Instagram, I think we've got some on there, of a beautiful new mural that wraps around the entire building. Um, and so, you know, with working with the engagement for this site, uh, we, when we work with our nonprofit partners, we also utilized um, a toolkit and um, developed this specifically for rebuilds, but, you know, we're sharing it out um, and hopefully these lessons can be, you know, transferred to other other communities as well with uh, templates for boards, surveys, focus group questions to kind of standardize and also provide a little bit of something for those different nonprofits to lean on um, in working with how to gather that community feedback in a way that um, just dives a little bit deeper that you're able to take all those post-it notes and sticky dots and, and really collate that information in a way that um, can drive decision making from program analysis through, you know, all the way, you know, down to finishes and, you know, deciding in color palettes for your playground equipment. So it's really the toolkit and the playbook, we call it, provides uh, templates for design engagement at each stage of design. And we can go on to Cobbs. This one was one of my favorites. Uh, so Cobbs Nature Playground um, is in the Cobbs Creek, West Philadelphia um, area of the city. This is a $1.6 million playground. Um, really, um, these, I would say even the, the photos on the left from the before, maybe, maybe they could look like it was too good, but there's, there's a piece of plywood kind of stuck there on a panel. And I think at one point it said playgrounds matter, you know, like this, was you know just a site that you could pass on the jogging trail along the creek and you wouldn't even recognize oh that's a playground so this was a real opportunity to leverage um just down the hill as uh one of uh i believe three environmental centers um that we have within the parks and rec system and so thinking about you know how could we reinvigorate this playground in a unique way to leverage the uh, community commitment the community had spent um the last several decades investing into uh, that environmental center, longtime community stewards really care for the kids to have a STEM education experience. And so working with 
um, our design um, team for this um, port um, was uh, just really creative in, in testing out some new materials. Um, on the on the right, you can see the um, playground equipment um, built off of um, a nature theme for the for the um, park and the creek. Um, and, and it was just really welcomed by uh, neighbors, by the uh, community that had been using the environmental center as almost an extension and allowing some revival of energy um, into the space. Um, and so um, it was just, you know, a really uh, oper building off of those assets, I would say a really good example of assets based community development, where, you know, you don't have to come in and, and you know, drop something that that doesn't reflect there's usually a story and a history in the community that you can um, find a new way to provide something in a way that actually does feel a little bit like a destination playground it's so unique and and folks are coming from all other parts of west philly to check it out um, so yeah hopefully that provides a, a little overview you can definitely um, check out more like i said on our instagram and facebook where you can see some more projects um, that have come to to life um, go to the next slide there's more on the way <laughs> uh you know we had um a little bit of a tough start with the pandemic um but tried to push through with virtual community meetings um you know having you know social distance and outdoor open house style events um and so those designs um are making it into a lot of groundbreakings coming up you know through the end of 2023 we do have um, some in 2024 that will actually still also start uh, their design. Just lifting up this many projects had to come out on a rolling basis. So just explaining, you know, when we meet with community, it's you know still a, a story of patience at times, uh, but knowing that it's been worth the wait and that with each site, because we take that intentional time, they are going to get something you know that's special and then unique just for their community. Um, all the way through into 2025. So there's, there's still a lot more to go. Uh, thanks for listening. And of course, you know, you can reach out um, and we're excited to, you know, answer your questions during the q and I'm gonna pass it on, I believe, to Megan. Yes, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm here today to talk about how my small and low income community, which was founded on the Pittsburgh steel industry, has bounced back from just decades of disinvestment and poor urban planning and environmental trauma uh, by engaging in a grassroots initiative called Eco Districts. And you can advance. I have a lot of images, so I'm going to go through the slides rather quickly. So just to start with some history and context, Etna is a river town on the north side of the Allegheny River, and it shares a border with the city of Pittsburgh. Next. Um, it sits in the River Valley. It's surrounded by green hills on one side, um, the river on the other. In this photo, you're seeing about a quarter of the town. So we're really a dense urban village, not even uh, one square mile in total. It was founded on the Spang Shalfant steel mill. And that's actually how it got its name because the burning red furnaces of the mill looked like an erupting volcano. So we're named after Mount Etna in Italy. Um, everyone who built a home here worked at the mill, they shopped in the town, it was completely self-sustaining. And at its height, there were 11,000 residents. Today, we have just under 3,500. Next. So over time, uh, the mill shrunk its production and it eventually closed. So residents started to move upstream and out into the suburbs. And in the midst of the economic decline, the community was bisected not once but twice by highway infrastructure projects and over 500 homes were taken to make way for the roads. We also have a history of environmental trauma, specifically flooding. We sit at the base of a 67 square mile watershed and continued upstream development has made the problem worse over time. So it was in 20, 2004, after that last flood in the aftermath of Hurricane Ivan, that leaders from Aetna knew that it was time to start thinking more proactively about the future of the community. Um, they no longer wanted to be victims of all those traumatic things that were happening to them. They wanted to rewrite the narrative and redefine what the community stood for. Specifically, they wanted to become leaders in green infrastructure and environmental stewardship. So it's really been a 180 degree shift from the carbon heavy industry of the past. 
In 2014, they adopted a new green master plan that set out a path for a green future. One of the most significant projects that you're looking at here um, is our downtown streetscape. It uses underground tunnels to collect stormwater and divert it from entering the combined sewer system and overflowing into the Allegheny River. Um, and the stormwater is held in retention tanks and filtered naturally into the ground. Um, we've also developed rain gardens um, and installed those where blighted properties have once stood. And the streetscape has been expanded now um, to most of the downtown corridor and there are new phases in construction as we speak. The green infrastructure projects also offer an opportunity for residents to get involved and volunteer to help create and maintain the projects. And not only do they have the benefit of beautifying the community, but in the case of our community garden, it gives folks an opportunity to grow their own produce in the summer and it also contributes produce to our local food pantry. So in our you know, rather urban environment, these projects help reconnect us with some of the natural elements. This is a nature trail that goes along the, the Pine Creek watershed and it's like everyone's favorite place to, to visit. Our largest project to date um, has been the Etna Riverfront Trail and Park, which actually sits at the site of the original Spang Shelfont steel mill. Um, so this trail will connect to the Allegheny Riverfront Trail, which goes um, into Pittsburgh and actually connects to the Gap Trail, which goes all the way to Washington, D.C. It'll also be a leg of the Pittsburgh to Erie Trail. So there's really no better um, symbol of our transformation than this. Um, it's the first time we've actually had access to our riverfront in our 150 year history. So while the borough of Etna was at work on all of those great green infrastructure projects we just looked at, our neighboring community in Millville had been developing its eco district with an architecture and planning firm in the region called Evolvier. So eco districts is an international organization that offers a protocol for communities to follow to create a community development plan that's rooted in sustainability, resiliency, and equity. And so it requires that a plan is developed by community members so that engagement is really key in that process. And the folks in Millville were engaging their residents by the hundreds. Eco District is also the name that we call a community that's committed to a holistic model of sustainability planning that empowers people to take ownership of their individual and collective futures. This can be an entire city, like cities like Seattle, Washington um, are, are pursuing eco-district certification or just a, a neighborhood in a city. So in 2016, Millville reached out to Etna and Sharpsburg, which are three river towns with similar populations, similar demographics and similar challenges. And the three set a course to um, form what we call the Triborough Eco District. It was really helpful for us to pull resources, pull capacity, and go after funding as a more regional collaborative. And the small group from each of the three communities spent about a year uh, meeting around dining room tables, trying to discuss how we would do it, um, who would be involved, and who would fund the work. And so we went into our three communities and began building cohorts of folks who were interested in volunteering. So we started to use that network and invited people to a local coffee shop. We started out with like 15 people around the table. The next month there was 20, then 25. And finally, we started outgrowing our small tables. And a year after, like that, that time period of quiet work um, and grassroots effort, we um, started to feel like the word was getting out and the momentum was building. Um, so we decided to expand this to the entire community. We got lawn signs, we printed flyers, and we rented out our local fire hall, and we put on a community meeting, and we were really nervous that no one would show up. Um, but 110 people came uh, through the doors that night and stayed for a two full hour meeting. Um, and we just kept hearing that residents were really excited and feeling more hopeful than they had in years. I think there was a lot of fear and anxiety um, at that time that no one would participate or that people would just show up you know, to complain. Um, but what people really wanted to do were two things. They wanted to tell their story and they wanted to make things better. And so they came out and they just kept coming. In 2018, the um, tribe, I'm sorry. Um, 
Yeah, you can advance the slide. <laughs> Thank you. In 2018, the Triborough Eco Drift was given $2 million from a local foundation. <laughs> so you're seeing the other end of the spectrum is in terms of uh, 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 foundation funding here. But, um, and a share of the funds were used to um, hire that firm Evolvier and begin a more robust process that much like um, took place in Millville in our neighboring community, it began with education. So each month we held a large scale community meeting on one particular quality of life issue. Um, so this is how we kind of broke down the Eco District's protocol and, and put it into language that people can understand. Each month we would talk about one issue that we dealt with in our community um, and got people's stories and feedback on it. So we talked about water, energy, air quality, mobility, food, and equity. And then a week later, people who were particularly passionate about that one specific quality of life issue um, got together to form a working group um, and create a vision in that area. And we called these um, champions groups. So the champions developed vision statements for each of the quality of life areas. Like I mentioned, water, mobility, air quality, energy, food, and equity. Um, these meetings allowed our neighbors, many who felt like they had, didn't have anything in common, to come together um, and find shared values that they could rally around together. And finding common ground was the basis for the plan, and it also helped build stronger community connections and a network in the community that we um, started to use and have been using ever since for volunteer capacity. We also went out into the community and met people where they were at. We went to churches, to festivals, sporting events, you know, sometimes we even went to the bars, you know, you name it. We wanted to get as much perspective as possible. So over that three year period, we held um, 36 meetings and events that, and engaged over 400 people who donated two hours or more of their time to help the NA Eco District come together. Many of those people became consistent volunteers and they continue to work with us to this day. So for me, Evolvier's way of leading the Eco District work by activating residents to do the process um, really strengthened the community as a whole. And in 2009, um, we completed our plan. Uh, members of the core group, which would eventually become the nonprofit that I run, the Ed Community Organization, uh, had to work really hard to translate the community developed plan into the Eco District's protocol, um, which was uh, required us to provide a lot of metrics and do a deep dive into the research, which is where the consultants came in um, to play and were uh, instrumental for us. Eco District certified that plan in November 2019 and, and Aetna became the world's first uh, certified Eco District. So having this distinction um, and an award-winning plan left us with a, a really deep sense of responsibility to see the projects that were developed by the residents and outlined in the plan through. The Eco District work really had a domino effect um, where we have rewritten our narrative. And these efforts and investments over many years have made a real impact. So our investments in infrastructure in the business district and park connections had led, have led to even more, con even more investment. Um, recently, our original steel mill, which I showed you in the first slide, um, which has sat vacant and we were really nervous about how we were going to find the funds to um, demolish it, uh, has been purchased and redeveloped. Um, this is a building that spans an entire city block and it is now the site where um, Westinghouse will be creating components for portable nuclear batteries. So the breathing new life into our original industry, which we're really excited about. Um, and I'm here today mostly to talk about our current project, which is the Aetna Center for Community and Community Library. Um, this community has been without a library um, for decades due to um, uh, those facilities being flooded in the past and also to school district consolidation. Um, and our residents were really, really clear that they wanted to bring an educational resource back to the community when we did the plan. They let us know that the library was the number one priority project to emerge from the plan, so we feel a really great sense of responsibility to bring this, this project to life. A few years ago, we conducted a feasibility study with a firm called Fourth Economy and the Allegheny County Library Association to determine how to bring library service back to the community. You can go to the next slide for this. 
they found uh, uncovered a lot of really interesting information that helps us to understand why this resource is so critical. Um, one thing that really jumped out to us was that 35% of households in the community don't have access to internet at home. And they also talked to us about the per capita income. Like I mentioned, we are a low income under-resourced community. Um, how many children were in the community at that time, which has only been growing since the study was completed. Can go next. Yeah. So in August of last year, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. In August of last year, we were able to raise enough funds to acquire this historic building in the heart of our business district, um, which was our goal because we wanted a site that was going to be accessible for everyone in the community to walk to. You can go next. And while we continue to fundraise for the project, um, we've activated the existing storefronts in the site um, and have created a pop-up library space. So we offer story times there, art classes, music classes, we do yoga, educational community meeting, and that's all supported by um, a contribution that we get annually from the borough of Etna. So as you can see, um, this is the site of the future Edna Center for Community, um, it's an historic building that was built in the 1800s. Um, the center picture shows you that it is a uh, building that has been seriously disinvested in over the years, um, but we have just about reached our fundraising goal and we're gonna begin construction on the project that you see on the right here in uh, 2024. We've been working with a really great architecture firm called GBBN, who does many of the um, Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh uh, renovation projects. Um, and this project will bring back a critical third space to the community um, that we don't currently have, where we can offer programs and resources and services to directly meet the needs of community members. Our community is in a period of, of rapid regrowth and revitalization, so it's important for us to preserve this space that is open to everyone right in the heart of the community and will be there for generations to come. It'll be a fully functioning library and community center, so as the needs of the community grow and change, um, we'll have a place to, 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 for, to, sorry, to provide those things that the residents need. And here's a, a look at the new re newly renovated um, addition on the back where we'll have a courtyard, where we'll offer environmental programming um, and um, community meetings for, for everyone. You can go to the last one. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think we skipped one, but that's okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I was very excited to show, share, you know, the pivot that this community, the transformation that it's taken. Um, and, you know, in the way that we, we did it as a grassroots effort with the residents of Aetna. So thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much to our presenters, uh, to Kira, Amanda, and, and Megan. Really, really inspiring, fascinating stories. It really shows you uh, what could be accomplished when you have passionate leadership and buy-in from the community. Uh, really, really inspiring stories. And to continue that discussion, uh, just to... Uh, reintroduce our moderator, Robert Tunyon. Um, Robert, take it away and continue this uh, fantastic informational discussion for us. Great, thank you very much. I have some planned questions and then we also welcome questions to come into the chat. Uh, so so ask away as you, uh, when you're ready for that. Um, I wanna thank, uh, first of all, uh, the panelists for your presentations. They were incredibly inspiring. I love what each of you are doing and I do, Kira and Amanda, I like to think of um, Etna as one of uh, one of your the communities that you're that you're working in, and, and also thinking about wow, what could we accomplish if we had to rebuild uh, rebuild Pittsburgh or rebuild Allegheny County? Uh, that would just be um, incredible. <laughs> and so, I also want to thank everybody who's taking time out of their lunch or their day to to be with us for allowing us to share thoughts. And hopefully, uh, our goal is to inspire. Uh, other work to take place. Uh, we want you to hear an idea today. We want you to take it or share it with someone. Um, I also want to thank Jeff and Adam. Uh, they spearheaded this idea, which I think is so important. You know, the small cities, they're like experiments or opportunities to experiment with ideas uh, and see how they happen. So again, 
uh, if you see something happening that we're doing, um, think of it as uh, we want you to share these ideas and take them and, and make them real. Okay, so uh, into questions. Um, as, as I said, I'm, I'm, kind, I'm coming from uh, an architecture position, an architecture background. I'm an architect with Rothschild Joiner Collaborative. Um, and I'm getting to ask uh, Kieran, Amanda, and Megan uh, specific questions that, uh, on things that they shared. And as we share, this is the Shaking Up Small Cities program. Uh, you're each taking a different approach to development, uh, but we'd love to hear, you know, in relation to what this program's mission is, how are your organizations shaking things up? How would you describe your model as different from traditional development? Kieran, Amanda, will you take the question first? Sure. Thanks, Robert. Um, I'll start and pass it over to Amanda. I think um, from the get-go, ours was unique in, of course, the funding source, um, certainly new to Philadelphia, and I think still not widespread across our country. Um, so that was certainly uh, set it apart, um, supported by a lot of advocates of children and families um, in Philly, too. Um, but I think the other piece really was what I referenced in terms of the really strong uh, focus and leadership around including diverse and women-owned businesses. Um, you know, that's not, nothing new for the city of Philadelphia or other areas, but I think the uh, strong intentionality um, and the uh, unwillingness, I think, to say no when people would say, well, we don't, we don't maybe know that firm, that architecture firm or um, that engineer or that contractor who's diverse because we're, you know, frankly used to working with this group. So really pushing our partners, um, I think, to think more expansively. Um, you know, unfortunately, that is a level of shaking things up in the, in the sense that I certainly think we've been talking about this for a long time, but I think we're really trying to get um, the rubber to, to hit the road. Um, and then I'm going to pass over to Amanda because I think some of it really is around um, the work on the ground level too. Yeah, I would just add, I think with the pandemic was uh, actually really helpful in us shaking up the traditional meeting town hall format and really having to move into smaller conversations, into outdoor open houses where, you know, we you know, tag up the, the boards, tie them up on the fence outside of the rec center and have folks come through and you know, I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, we had one outside and, you know, our project manager is grabbing people off the bus stop and pulling folks in and meeting folks where they are. And really, you know, I'm just grateful to our, our you know, our various uh, professional service teams who have jumped into that very hands-on approach with us and recognizing that, you know, this is not, um, you know, going to be the big, you know, town hall, everyone comes in a clicker and a slideshow. This is really about intimate conversations with community members on what they need and want for their sites. Great. And Megan, um, maybe you could follow up. How, how are you doing things differently? Um, I think our process did a couple of things differently that were really effective. The first was um, just having the planning process be completely resident centered. Um, I think, uh, you know, offered the opportunity to have a lot of buy-in for the plan right off the bat, obviously, but what it also did was it created this network that we didn't have in the community before of residents who wanted to be involved and engaged and who we could uh, call on time and time again, because once we started implementing, you know, some of the projects from the plan, there was also the need you know, to maintain those projects um, and to help build the next one. So having that network created through the planning process was totally instrumental in making this whole thing a success. And then also um, how Evolve EA started off the planning process with a full year of education. So we did 12 months of just educational programs with the residents on the different quality of life issues. You know, your residents are the experts in the community that you live in, but it is really helpful to give context to them, educate them on the issues of, in ways that they may not have understood before and um, get everyone on the same page before you begin that planning process. So I think that was an, a really instrumental part of our process here. Yeah, and uh, just channeling Jeff and Adam, I think one of the reasons that we heard in the first meeting that we were brought together is because we this is not a traditional development model. There isn't an outside developer that's coming in and leading the process. And uh, we have this opportunity where uh, government organizations, nonprofit organizations are really taking charge, um, but also, making sure that it's grassroots, the, re the residents are leading. 
So um, kind of going into that, I'm sure that both of you are asking uh, the design professionals to act in different ways, to perform in different ways. So almost uh, if you could share uh, some advice for design professionals uh, from your perspective, how, uh, how, can, how can they be more successful and what ways have they been successful in yours? And Megan, the question will go to you first. Yeah, the, um, the thing that um, Evolvier did, which was so important in my community, um, was that they translated the language that the Eco Districts Protocol set forth because it's it's pretty academic. You know, here people are concerned a lot more with like um, food insecurity and um, issues that affect you know their their pocketbooks and their bottom line. So sustainability is a concept that they're not thinking about on a daily basis, even though it does have major implications in their life, especially here in, in terms of flooding. Um, so the way that they were able to translate the language that we were using to just talk about these issues and put it into context that, and, through, and see it through lenses that they could understand was, was really everything. It was what made it so impactful and successful here because it helped start a conversation that people felt like they had a place in. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, a lot of Pittsburghers, um, you know, when we're talking about affecting ecosystems downstream, you know, it's a little bit more abstract. But if you're talking about wet basements, you know, we all get it. And it's, it's the reality of how uh, the, the community was engaged. Um, uh, Amanda, Kira, um, how have you been successful in engaging design professionals? How have they been successful in engaging in your projects? Yeah, I, I would go a little bit to peel behind the scenes a little bit here on how we work with our teams. Usually we have um, like an engagement uh, vendor provider who is, you know, not only coordinating the outreach of, you know, flyering, canvassing, getting people to logistics for a meeting, but they're also pre-meeting with the design team, you know, six, eight weeks out ahead of the meeting to develop the boards, to develop the questions, surveys, and really ensure that these are authentic questions that are going to inform the design. So we're kind of, we're working together to um, be reflective of what's in the scope, what, you know, we don't want to ask questions that we can't deliver. We want to look for the design opportunities where, you know, we're not pre-making decisions in our head either. Where can people really weigh in? whether that's about you know, space analysis and programming, deciding we're gonna knock down a wall and move it over here. And you know, when, you, when you walk through your center, what do you need first? Where, where are you plugging in your phone? Where are the kids happening? You know, getting people to give us that information that will then inform you know, the new layout for a space. Um, so post, in a, post meeting or post event, you know, our engagement firms write out a full documented report, look for the contradictions, look for the consensus points, and share that with our design firms. So, you know, taking time to like really read through, we'll have a post meeting session together where we look at the findings. What did you hear from that conversation? What did you hear? Okay, you know, and, and, and really make sure we're on the same page as they go into develop the next iteration of their drawings. And then when we get to milestone reviews, you know, we, we sit down with Parks and Rec, with the free library as the asset owners. And again, it's another opportunity to fact check what we heard what the design team is proposing and making sure we're all in alignment. So I think just being ready to work with us and the various voices, as well as the engagement firm who does that work of, you know, kind of distilling and, you know, finding consensus of all the public feedback, but then really making sure that that's showing up in each stage of the drawings. Yeah, I, think I that was, add. Go ahead, Kira, thank you. No, it's okay. If I can just add one thing to that, I'd say, um, or two things. One is, I think, on a more macro level, recognizing um, that even though we are a citywide program, like Amanda was saying earlier, Megan, you were saying, in you know, our neighborhoods are, are distinctive, as are in most cities, and understanding that and recognizing um, and even socializing that for at the expense maybe of a little bit of speed, we have a very um, unique and individual approach to each neighborhood and what they need at their site versus coming up with, for example, a playground typology and then rolling that out across every playground that we're involved in across the city. So I think that was one piece from a design perspective. And um, when we started, we very much wanted to have some, um, some difference in the neighborhoods, be responsive to what we were hearing and bringing on different architectural firms also um, across the city who would bring their perspective and approach. And then I think the other piece is, like Amanda said, connecting 
our design firms to community members and our engagement um, our engagement groups really tightly so that the linkage there is strong. And then asking the tough question of our design teams to think about how you bring beauty and a quality that may not have been there before while balancing the need for durability and maintenance. And so I know we're gonna probably talk about maintenance later, but I just think that's those two things are sometimes at odds or there's a tension. And sometimes we also have to pull our community members along to say, it's okay to want more than just this, right? You, you We can think more to your point, Megan, I think you talked about, you have to kind of provide the, the context sometimes with the wet basement, okay, get that. And then how do we have people think even more um, outside of just the basics they've been used to. So we press on our design teams to do that while working within a budget. And we know that's a challenge too. I really love what I'm taking notes <laughs> as a design professional. Thank you. I think um, this idea of uh, repeating back and capturing what we heard is so critical. Um, it's something that I, I do try to practice. I loved your comment earlier in your presentation, Amanda, about boutique process like you go somewhere and I, you don't have a one size fits all, you know, you have to almost get on the ground and then figure out, ask what do you think will work and try different things until you find a process that really fits. And so I think custom uh, created processes are incredibly important wherever you work, you have to understand that. Um, so thank you both for covering that. Those are great lessons for architects and planners. One of the things I wanted to hear from each of you, um, Amanda, I think you were doing this a bit in your presentation, uh, but even on our earlier call, you, 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 both Kira, Amanda, uh, Megan, um, you, you were able to tell specific stories, something about something a resident did, something that uh, you saw that. So I would love you to share a story about how a resident was engaged through your organization's project and how how did that individual gain a leadership role that carried the project forward, um, starting with Kira and Amanda. That's a hard one. I was like, Megan, can you go first? <laughs> because I'm like, there's so many, but I want to think of one who really came through in a way that, I mean, we have somebody like Miss L at Fodderell Square who, she was always a leader, but if you give me a second, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think of a really good one for you for that. Okay. All right. So Megan, how about you? Yeah, I have a good one. Um, so one of the cool things about you know starting the eco district process was that there was just like a lot of buzz around it. People were really excited because there are so many communities like ours in Allegheny County. We have over 130 municipalities in the county. A lot of them are really small, like ours, and under resourced. I mean, and a borough is less than a square mile, but we have our own government, we have our own police force, we have our own volunteer <laughs> fire. So like, there's a lot of communities like ours who are struggling, and this was kind of like a like a you know just a beacon of hope for them. So people from outside of the of the borough, from all around the region, would come to these meetings just to kind of learn what we were doing and see how it went. And there was a woman who um, lived in the South Hills, and if you know anything about Pittsburgh geography, like if you there's a north side. Of Pittsburgh proper and south side because we have three rivers and if you live on the north or south you will do like anything to not have to cross two rivers to go somewhere so you'll give any excuse not to do that but she came all the way from the south hills to Etna which is on the north side of the Allegheny um, on a bus slowest way to travel to attend these meetings and she was there every month just because she was interested in sustainability initiatives she was interested in green design um, and she like slowly Came out of her shell and started taking a leadership role she became a member of the food champions group she led community events at our community garden which is like a 45 minute bus ride from her house um and when we formed our nonprofit, she was one of the founding board members she's still on the board today and she like started she even had a career shift for now she works in like green design in pittsburgh um for some for some firms here so it was a really cool um, experience to watch her kind of like start her journey and get really excited about this and become an honor. She still doesn't live here, but she's an honorary Etnian, you know, and a great friend. We love her so much. Um, so that, and there are more, there are more people like her, people from in the community who really just kind of stepped up and took a leadership role and in different um, initiatives, but she really stands out just for her just tenacity and dedication to the Eco District's process. 
And and, and Megan, just to clarify, is that Venny Middle? Yeah, her name's Venny. <laughs> okay, and Amanda, uh, did you have enough time? Yeah, I mean, there's so many. So I'm like, okay, I'll tell you guys about Todd McCoy um, over at uh, FJ Myers. The FJ Myers Rec Center, um, I would say that community has this, the site. It's just really interesting history that it was uh, historically an orphanage. And, you know, you could see the building is kind of cut up in these corners and it's not really, it wasn't designed as a rec center. So with that sort of adaptive reuse, but as a community, they overall just have found a way to fill up every corner of that building with programming. And I think Todd really stepped in as a bridge where through the pandemic, the advisory council, you know, had completely changed from the folks that we had started to interview with, but he was always serving as this, you know, connector to all the different permit holders and activities. And once a month, you know, they host their advisory council meeting with every, you know, permit holder who has an activity comes and, and it's sort of like he's the mini, mini mayor here, but he's very subdued, steps back, but is just trying to bring everybody that they will find a place. And, you know, if they, if they were here before, you know, as we go through the construction process, keeping everyone connected. So, you know, whether we're doing, you know, pop-ups on site with the after school program or, you know, just, you know, keeping folks connected who maybe are not as formally involved, but coming out to play basketball or, you know, wanting to build up a community garden. He was sort of this connector and you need someone who's going to be that bridge builder. Um, I think, you know, we saw it, you know, at, and even at our groundbreaking, you know, he's he's calling out the older members who passed that torch to him. And so I think, um, you know, it, it you can't replace, you know, you just, you, they're, they're so essential to the heart of, of these sites. So, you know, Todd is, you know, I, mean, I just can't wait to see him come back in and, and, and continue that flourishing um, at FG Myers. Yeah, I, and I, I, one of the reasons I had asked about, you know, a person is because uh, maybe Amanda, Kira, Megan, you all feel this way, but some of the work that we do, we, we're almost conduits for, to help make other people's dreams, you know, real, right? We're working with residents to uh, hearing what they say and the thing that they care the most about, but they're really the people, you know, they're the person that's making that project happen. And without those heroes, uh, it, a lot of things don't happen. So they're very special. We could have done a whole presentation, um, not on projects, but on people that are the, the, the real champions here. So um, just moving on, I, uh, Kira, your slide on 90% um, of spaces in, in Philadelphia, the public spaces need reinvestment, is just, it's just so astounding. And, and I feel that way every day when I drive around or walk around Pittsburgh, that there's just so much that we have to do to build back uh, and then to rebuild our communities. Um, you talked a little bit about this. I think it's worth elaborating. How does your organization identify and select projects to work on within the community? I think you spoke about an earlier process, um, uh, uh, and 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 it was a, an approval process, you know, to select certain areas. Um, if you can elaborate on that uh, a little bit more, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Yeah, it's really hard to choose when there, unfortunately, are are way too many sites that that have need. Uh, absolutely. And I think um, the beginning approach, as I mentioned, was um, really looking at um, crime data. Uh, it was looking at health indicators, um, asthma, uh, obesity, and diabetes. Um, and it also was looking um, at uh, census data, such as residential building permits, household growth, um, and poverty. So really trying to take all of that and call it so that there was on some level an informal um, data set that gave a little bit of a kind of ranking it did anything bubble up to the top based on on those indicators um, because we already knew there was a lot of need and then came the piece of working with the um, district council members uh, who certainly do know their districts and their and their sites and that part actually went um, very well i think that um, they had a strong voice and once they felt assured that they also had a, a voice in that process marrying the data with their on the ground knowledge um, and you know certainly people came out to advocate for their sites um, which which they still do 
is really how we narrowed how we narrowed it down. Uh, and of course, the budget was the limiting factor. So the majority of our sites, um, as I think I mentioned earlier, are in high need neighborhoods. So um, really, and geographically, all across the city of Philadelphia. So it's really, if you know, you pin the dots on the map, you see a really broad um, spread, but not in, not an easy task. I think also, you know, once you dive into this, you really just like to do every site. Um, and I just would add the other thing, which I, again, think is not unique, but the level of, um, you know, inability through, through the city budget for years, the level of disinvestment um, at some of these sites, it really has been many decades. Um, and that's unfortunately not an exaggeration. So, um, yeah. It's just so great that um, sometimes, uh, you know, what we're finding, um, and I don't know if you'll if you'll find this to be true, but you know, the thing that Megan's working on ceased to exist. So it had deteriorated to such a state where it's no longer. And if you have the opportunity to save something, that's just so important because it still exists there. And I, I want to go back to Amanda's point um, with the asset-based approach. If you're working in somewhere that has something and it still has the people, it has the individuals that are still running program, even though it's disinvested, the human capital is perhaps the most important portion. So um, I think what Megan is trying to do, and maybe Megan, you can speak to this, um, when something's lost and you've lost that human capital behind it and you've lost that physical uh, asset, you know, where do you start and, and how do you build back? And so maybe you could share a little bit about how uh, you've been uh, working towards that to build back both the human capacity and the uh, physical asset. Yeah, building back the human capacity was a long process, I would say. Um, I think a lot of things kind of were converging at the same time that made that possible. You know, with so much disinvestment in the community, so much job loss, population loss, there was really like a lost generation here. Um, so there were people who were leading in the community who stuck around and did it for decades because everyone else who was younger than them took off for greener pastures, you know? Like our council president retired a few years ago after serving for over 50 years which was like mind blowing, right? Of just the dedication to the community, but there was no one there to step up. Um, so when they decided to take on some of these green infrastructure initiatives, they created, you know, like, and like I kept saying, they kind of tried to rewrite their narrative. People took notice and people started moving back into the community. And um, honestly, I was one, Robbie and I were two of those people um, who heard good things that were going on. And so it was just the actions that they started to take on their own to be proactive that people took notice of and wanted to be a part of. So when the eco district um, process started, you know, there was a real hunger there to become involved and there was there was new people in the community who were interested in helping to lead the way. So, you know, I sit on the council um, with people who are generations older than me and we all work together really well. And um, the intergenerational cooperation is something that has really fostered like a very wide network because everyone feels like they have a place in it. It's not just a, it's not just a thing for young transplants to the community. It's something for everybody. Um, so I think just all those things kind of happening at once helped us to build back that human capacity. And then we also, you know, put our money where our mouth is and we started implementing these little projects. We did like a solar canopy and EV charging station. We did a parklet at the site of this abandoned building that's at the base of our floodplain and a, and, a, and a green garden there. People started seeing those transformations and that helped get the momentum going too and helped get more people involved. Um, as far as bringing back the infrastructure, can you repeat the second part of your question? No, I think that, I think Megan, I think you touched on the really important part okay. um, about, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, really um, uh, Pittsburgh uh, suffered um, for for many years of having people, uh, shr a shrinking city, and you saw that in the one slide, um, but, you know, for, you know, in AD, it continued in the 80s, the 90s, and the early 2000s that, that people weren't, weren't uh, were getting educated in Pittsburgh, or they grew up in Pittsburgh, and they were leaving, and so it's, it's part of a tough, uh, tough legacy to build back from that. Um, we're seeing some success now. 
<laughs> can so, I jump uh, in, Robert, before you go? Because yeah, yeah. I do want to tell Miss L's story because it reminds me of this in terms of like not overlooking people and leadership, you know, sure. and who can step up. And I think it's about the torch passing from Miss L at Fodero Square, who was an elder who stayed through the neighborhood's disinvestment and the next set of leaders that, you know, you have um, Tyrone, who's probably in his late 40s and then you have reggie who grew up you know within the community and you know it's maybe in his early 30s right so you have to find those folks at the next level but you know creating a, an opportunity a platform a space where folks can come in and say you know what i grew up in the neighborhood and and i love this space or you know um their education levels their you know backgrounds you know may not in our minds be the typical of who you see coming out to community meetings high you know we, let's let's just be honest about you know the education and socioeconomics of the typical civic association member folks who have the social and economic capital for the extra time to come out to meetings is to say you know what we're going to spend time we're going to build a relationship so that you are informed and that you can you know come in and, and be a part and make real decisions and to see that you know, it, it just takes time to have authentic relationship with people who do care about their neighborhoods and not to overlook folks. Um, so that that torch passing um, was successful in Fodderall, um, and they were able to, you know, have new members come in, help them with their bylaws for their civic, for their, I mean, for their friends group to, to you know, grow that um, and, and, you know, just, you know, I don't know, I guess really want to say we say be equitable in our approach. I think it comes down to the people that we build these relationships with. Robert, if I could jump in briefly with with a couple questions, and I just want to say I I, I love those uh, comments uh, that that you had and Amanda that you had, and I wrote down an idea for a future um, presentation that feature the people. I mean, I think those stories are very very inspiring, and it really shows you that there are so many people committed to their communities to honor what it was and then develop it to what it could be, and I and I think that's that's one of the things that. Um, we we really need to touch on in a future broadcast. But um, uh, just a couple questions we have from the audience. I'll combine two of them and I'll throw them out there um, uh, to the panel and to Robert how you want to handle them. Um, the, one big question was again if if the panelists could touch on how was the funding developed for these programs and along with that are there uh, basic resources that you use to engage the community to participate in the Echo District program? And can these resources be shared with, with, with the audience? Sure, I can start with that. So as far as the planning process went, the funding was provided by a local foundation, and it was provided because we did this comprehensive um, ask from three communities. Like I said, we're three very small communities, so taking a more regional approach to it was what really benefited us. Um, and it was instrumental in us in doing the work at all because we were able to hire a consultant to guide us through it. You know, we are small community, not a lot of capacity. Um, so we wouldn't have been able to do it without that funding and that support from our consultants. Um, since then, in order to fund our projects, we go through um, a lot of county, state, and federal grant application processes. Um, we find a lot of success in that realm because our state senator, Lindsey Williams, and our former state rep, Sarah Namorado, and our current state rep, Lindsey Powell, um, have been with us every step of the way. They were at those meetings in the early days, even before they were elected. So they're tremendous allies to us, and they advocate for us in Harrisburg. Um, so that has been, I don't know if that was just a, a you know, happenstance of good fortune, but we have those wonderful women on our side. And they've been helping us um, every step of the way and continue to do so. Um, one of the challenges we see certainly with those grants though, being an under-resourced community, is that we have struggled with some of the requirements of the grant, such as like if a grant's reimbursable or if a grant's a matching required grant, because we don't have that capital to start with. And we're slowly building it over time, but I think it's detrimental to small, low-income communities like ours that those requirements exist. And Megan, maybe just if you can clarify uh, what a match grant is or what a reimbursable grant is, just so they have the context. Okay, yeah. So in order to be eligible for a matching grant, you have to have the um, 
the, the amount of money that you're asking for on hand already, you have to match those funds or a certain percentage of those funds. And a reimbursable grant, you have to, to be eligible to receive that. You have to have, you have to pay for the project up front and then you'll be reimbursed through the granting authority afterwards. So I think that taps into a lot of the conversations. I think Kira and Amanda, you, you, you are focused on neighborhoods that, uh, that you know maybe maybe don't have those resources we're certainly one of them so if you have a two million to ten million dollar project they're not sitting there with five million dollars waiting to pay the rest of the uh the, the project and that's the kind of set, setup that we have a lot of times where we're just like well what we're not going to do this thing and <laughs> and i think that's why the funding um that uh model that that you all have is just so incredible but i'm sure there are, are are challenges too if you if you would speak to the successes and challenges around your funding uh that'd be really helpful yeah i will say i think i naively thought when i uh, started working for the initiative that you know i'd never worked any place where you came in and it was all already funded um you know it's always so come from where your world where you're always scraping you get you have the vision and then you're scraping together the dollars to support the vision along the way um so i thought well this is going to be cake um, you know, we have the dollars we're going to run. Um, I would not describe it as easy, uh, still, um, not to burst that bubble for everybody, but I think our challenge has been, um, the, because of, I think the nature of the vision of the program and the scope and scale of the program, um, the budgets were really aligned around safe, clean and ready to use, um, and really just bringing facilities into functioning, uh, level. The aspiration and the thinking and the vision of the mayor and others around the program and the project was really aspirational and transformational. Those two budgets are not the same. So I think we've been doing a lot of work kind of trying to rectify that. Then add on top of it, on top of it as we all know, kind of the pricing of construction um, post pandemic or during the pandemic. And then add on top of that, as we've dived into these sites, recognizing that the need is even greater um, than we had anticipated, even outside of the transformational vision. And it's really hard to walk away doing half of a site when nobody's been at the site for 50 years and with this vision of what rebuild could be. So we are constantly, I think, addressing that tension. And then still now, I think in the world that you all are and I'm familiar with of, of how do we raise more dollars and how do we pull more to really make these sites whole? So we didn't, unfortunately, we didn't, get out of that, which I thought we would. Uh, we're still right there with all those challenges. Uh, not complaining, um, but it's always, the bar always, I feel like kind of goes higher. Mm -hmm. That's, I can only imagine the scope and scale of what you're taking on. Uh, there could never be enough, um, there could never be enough, right? And so you always want to do more as well. Um, I think it's an opportunity now to uh, kind of get back to that original idea of what Shaking Up Small Cities is all about. We're trying to pay it forward with ideas uh, that can happen in other small cities and other neighborhoods. Um, I would appreciate if, if you could take a little bit of time um, to pay it forward to, to the attendees. Talk about an idea that you've used in your work that maybe you haven't covered already that can be borrowed by others. So Amanda, will you start us off? What, what, what would you like to see replicated most of all? Hmm. I think um, creating the toolkit provides like a playbook that others can use and then make for their own. So, you know, whether it's going to be something that you, you know, you can kind of start off with at one site and then give those lessons or give those tools to other sites to use, that has been a real, um, a way for each site to then create and customize is you give them a, something to jump off of. And, you know, we've used Google Docs um, and Google Slides as a hub. So our playbook is all a digital system that then you can make a copy and it's free and it allows you to like, you know, take that in, in with your team and then like add in the, you know, pieces that are, you know, relevant for your site, delete, change. And really, honestly, is quite accessible for you know smaller organizations that don't have InDesign or Adobe, all the fancy stuff. So I think um, you know an idea to steal for sure would be to utilize these free tools. I think Canva is another one that our comms team uses with um, being able to do the social media posts and 
provide toolkits for others to go out and spread the word um, within community. So, you know, take advantage of those, um, but you can create like a little, we call it the home base. And it's a folder that's like pre-populated with all those templates that they can use. Um, so um, if anyone follows up afterward, I can also maybe show you a little sneak peek of how our, how our playbook works. That's great. Thank you, Amanda. Kira? What would you like other people to um, take, you know, as an idea? What would you like to see replicated? As much as I said, there were still challenges on pulling the funding we really need to address the problem we're trying to address. I do think um, having a dedicated source of revenue is incredible. I think having a mayor behind something like this, um, you know, means a, a lot in terms of really, um, you know, operating within a city and the bureaucracy that, you know, we all face, et cetera, um, has been incredibly helpful. So I think stating that vision and thinking really big in our case um, has been to those that have that capacity, you know, in the audience or can push for that. I think um, it, it does a, a lot. We've had a lot of learnings, but, I think being able to set something up with a really, um, we let budgets kind of keep us tight, right? Which is real, but you have to, like you guys did, have the vision and think big enough to get people, like you talked about, Megan, excited about what's coming and leaning in. And I think um, generating that and not always operating from a position of scarcity, but instead of um, a vision of what's possible um i think is is so important it's really how you get people invested and involved and excited and i think frankly we could all use some of that so very well said i think vision is is so critical uh megan um how about you what would you like <laughs> people to borrow um and and utilize yeah i mean i touch a lot about well i have kind of two ideas for this one is focused more on like municipal planning and ones on project implementation so uh, i talked a lot about you know it being resident center and i talked a lot about starting with education but one thing that um we did really that i didn't talk a lot about but was central to our planning process was that um social equity was like the umbrella lens that we looked at every topic that we discussed through so it was you know when we're talking about sustainability project and we're talking about green infrastructure and we're talking about how to fix our problems with water we're looking at it from how does it affect people first and foremost um, and how it's going to um, hopefully enhance the lives of people that live here and give everyone a chance to thrive in Etna. so hiking um, social equity essential component to um, all of your conversations and all of your planning process and then when it comes to project implementation you're finding your partners, um, and this is probably really obvious. One thing that we have had a lot of success with is we pick the best partners. So, you know, in Pittsburgh area, at Wellbeings, they're the best urban planning consulting firm, and GBBN is the absolute best um, when it comes to library design projects. And they, you know, when you don't have a lot of capacity on your organizational side, having those really high-end professionals help guide you through the process. You know, they know what they're doing. Um, they can work with you. They can um, make sure that you're getting the best product in the end is huge because um, kind of like what Kira was saying, you got to think big. And in communities like ours, there's this attitude where things are just like good enough. You know, like that's good enough for it. They can have the secondhand library and they can have the uh, like hand-me-down books and they can deal with the flooding. But, you know, it's not good enough because residents here deserve better. And so, you know, um, like you said, shoot for the stars and, and, and consult with those people who are going to get you there. It's a, and and uh, I, I heard you mention Evolve uh, EA several times, another one of our uh, past AIA presidents. So a little shout out to uh, Mark and his team. Uh, Rob, yeah. there are a couple more questions uh, in, in the chat, uh, if, if I could, and, and a couple more flowing in. I know we're running short on time. Um, uh, one of the questions was, what steps uh, have you or, or do you take to mitigate the poorly planned state and federal highway and parkway projects? A lot of the communities, especially um, the environmental justice areas, are being adversely uh, impacted for generations by these projects. What did you do to address that issue? Um, Megan, your slides showed Route 8 and Route 28 uh, ripping through Etna. Um, do you, just to just to answer, um, just to, with a little you know knowledge, uh, is that. Uh, <laughs> 
very little. Um, it, it, it just it crushed us, and it's still crushing us today. Um, but the borough, Megan, will you talk about your current project to uh, build a new connector trail? Yeah, there's a lot of things we're trying to do. It's incredibly difficult because these are just, they're like monsters in your community. Um, to get to our riverfront trail and park, you have to cross under uh, several lanes of highway overpasses, cross over several on and off ramps onto the federal highway, um, and it's very dangerous. So it's difficult to get to this like beautiful new asset that connects us to a riverfront. So we are involved in engineering and design right now to make it more pedestrian and bicycle friendly by offering some off-road options, um, bike lanes and infrastructure. That's one project. There's also some money coming down from the federal government um, for reconnecting communities. Um, and we're looking into uh, possibly getting funding for highway overpasses because there's a section of our community that was completely cut off by the Route 8 expansion. Um, and it's almost impossible for them to get into the heart of the community and even take advantage of all of these new programs and resources that we're offering. Um, and we've also done a really big push to just plant more trees. We got $50,000 from the County Health Agency to just plant trees along the highway corridors just to help offset some of that pollution. But I mean, they're gonna be here forever. Uh, so we just try at the hyper local level to you know do some sort of interventions that we can to make life a little easier for our residents. Anyone else with thoughts on that question? And, and I know we have um, uh, a few more questions too. Okay, um, Robert, again, if I may, I don't wanna um, overstep, but I do wanna read some of these questions off uh, from our audience. Um, we have somebody from out of state, somebody from Ohio, who is a council person and a mayoral candidate for a little town outside of Cleveland. Even though um, we mostly Steeler fans uh, in Western PA, we're happy to help our, our Cleveland neighbors. Uh, um, it, uh, um, uh, so there's a little town similar in size to Aetna, and um, it's very important, uh, as you know, to engage the community to motivate and uh, what strategies did you use to motivate the community? Like basically, where did you begin? And I, I could say we did a, a uh, I was involved in a similar project out here in Harrisburg. One of the things we did to motivate the community was have some, um, you know, visionary uh, drawings and renderings of what could be. And that really inspired the local community when they came out to look at it and they thought, wow, this is what we could do if we all get together. Uh, what what are your experiences to, to the panelists to really get the community more engaged and more motivated? Meg, can I uh, can I talk yeah, about I our mayor? I, guess, I just love I love that a mayor or candidate is on. Um, uh, Etna's mayor is Mayor Tom Rangers, and um, he is somebody who uh, you know weathered the storm in a way. He was here for the mill closing. He was here for the floods, um, and he also saw it through towards the um, infrastructure investments um, in stormwater. Those leaders had accumulated quite a lot of power, quite a lot of knowledge. And um, I think it was maybe to Amanda's point earlier that you also have to be looking towards that next generation. And those that are in power, and I imagine as a mayor or candidate, you have a lot of relationships and a lot of uh, connections already, um, to make sure that the door is open to others. And so when you create that table, like our mayor did, um, he, uh, he invited, really, Megan and I to sit at this, this table. He made more seats at it. Uh, so where do you get started? You add more seats to the table by inviting people in and allowing new ideas that may be challenging to the existing ones. They may not even be good ideas yet, but you're al at least allowing people to come and sit around that table. So I think that's the first thing to do, is to build uh, your, your, your smaller network that can help um, get the larger project started, which is bringing people together. So our first thing is we, um, the existing leaders made, made space. We met um, as groups until that feeling of needing to get, um, go ahead. And then as a, I think Megan um, gave that point earlier about if it's a small town, are there other towns that you can collaborate with to become a larger town in a way? Not saying that you're merging borders, but you have partners who will help you uh, fundraise, share ideas, and work together. Those are some of the points that we did. 
I think that's those are great comments too, and I certainly want to hear from the panelists. And I think uh, Robert, you've kind of answered uh, one of the other questions out there. Uh, you know, how do you dispel the anger and distrust in the community that has maybe been promised a lot, maybe not a lot delivered in the past? And I think that's a very good comment, uh, and that goes a long way towards building that community trust. Uh, giving those seats at the table and really making sure that people do have a voice and, th and that that voice is being heard. Um, any any other uh, thoughts uh, from the panelists on those those few points? Um, I would just, I think, add, I, yeah, man, I'm sure his thoughts um, to just, um, you know, part of the vision of Rebuild was also to, to, to some extent, rebuild that, what we've called kind of that civic compact and that trust between um, residents and their government. And we do a lot of communication and have a lot of transparency in the work we do, good, bad, or ugly, um, to really try and rebuild that trust. And it's really important. And we're really, really conscious and careful that um, we don't say or promise things we can't deliver. We're honest about our limitations um, and that we're constantly elevating uh, the voice of the residents we're working with, because that is the point. It is their, it is their space. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there, Amanda. Yeah, I'll get nitty gritty and say cost estimating is our best friend. Um, you know, we do it at, you know, every stage of design and we bring that temperature check back with community. And I mean, we'll get very honest about the numbers. So I look at that as like how I can maintain that or no one's going to be happy when you see the numbers are high or you see that it's all going into HVAC and electrical, but at least it's honest. And I think that that people understand the fair, you know, the fairness or, or the, the authenticity in that is that you're coming to the table to really tell them like, you know, but this is about that generational investment. So when we handle your roof, it's not going to be those leaks and plaster patching like we're trying to do this right. And we're gonna, you know, make sure the investment is going in a way that, you know, we, we open up the hood and show them what, you know, we're, what we're going to, you know, bring bring those dollars towards. So I think that has helped, um, and it does involve, you know, a lot of like, you know, simplifying, you know, a, a multi-page report and taking some extra time to kind of condense it a little bit. And it's that that middle ground between like a layman's understanding and the technical because folks want to be educated they want to understand the complexity of their sites and, and how those dollars are, are coming so um trying not to simplify simplify too much but just enough so that it is accessible for people that you know they, they have a grocery budget at home they understand that hard decisions have to be made so you know coming coming to you know community meeting or a stakeholder update and sharing that information you know they they're they're interested in their listening that's a great point too and i i think uh you know i think people also understand that the cheapest fix is not always the best fix and and uh i i think what what a great what a great point um uh, boy i i feel like this could go on uh for a couple more hours um i believe the slides will be available uh, that was one other question we had but um I'll, I'll just open it up to any any quick closing thoughts as as we wrap up our session here as we come to uh and sorry we're slightly over time but uh, really, what a great presentation. Any closing thoughts from the panelists and Robert from you? Oh, I would just I would just say thank you to everybody. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to share our story and um, hopefully you know inspire some people to think about community development in a new way. So I appreciate it. I just echo the thanks. Really appreciate the opportunity. And thanks, Robert, for your great uh, moderating questions as well. Absolutely, I'll, I'll echo that. I will thank our panelists, uh, Megan, Kira, and Amanda. Robert, I knew the first uh, practice session we had, we were going to have a great moderator, and you you definitely came through and proved that. I want to thank everybody who stuck with us for a couple minutes uh, over time. And I, I truly, this was uh, one of the best uh, uh, shaking up small cities presentations we've had. It continues to build, and I think that's a testament to uh, both uh, Jeff Pasfa and Adam Trot and and our or help that we have from AI of Pennsylvania. So I wanna thank you for participating. Um, if you if you are on here and you are in a community that maybe has a great story to tell or uh, is looking for more help or more information, please get in contact. You can see on the slide, uh, Jeff's email and Adam's, uh, also mine. We can be contacted through AIA Pennsylvania. I wanna give Jeff and Adam just a couple seconds each to, if, if they wanna close out and say a few words of thanks, 
since really this is a project that was started and carry, carried on by the two of you. And, and also I wanna thank the team at AIA Pennsylvania, uh, Susan, Amal, Olivia, um, uh, they make my job easy because they're they're the best, and 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 these are some things that we are pursuing as as AIA Pennsylvania. Uh, Jeff and Adam, any final final thoughts? Yeah, I'll jump in here. Um, yeah, Jeff, thanks for the inception of this thing a, a few years ago. And um, today, the 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 real value of today was to shake up how things are getting done. And you guys are living examples, and we really appreciate you sharing your story about how you did that. Thank you. Yeah, same same thing. Uh, thanks for sharing the stories, and I think this exceeded all of our expectations. Uh, uh, multifold, you know. I think we got um, great questions and and great moderated moderated questions from from Robert. Again, I think Steve's already mentioned that and, and even from the audience, I think that these are a great conversation. Hopefully we get the chance to do this with other communities and, and maybe even do this again if, if everybody's up for it. Maybe we can find another time that we can do this uh, with the same group uh, another time. Great, thank you. All right, thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day and uh, stay tuned for the next uh, episode of Shaking Up Small Cities. Appreciate your time. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, you too. Thank you. All right, bye. Take care.